Hello, hello. Welcome back. Uh, I hope that the mic and the music is fine this time. How about now? Alright, mm, let me find my audio stuff. What about now? And we can we can do it like this. Uh, I turned down a bit the the volume or the music. Okay. So we have something special, and it's not special anymore. Uh, it's starting to ship, so it's not actually special. Uh, we have the HHKB Studio, but first, uh, I think I'll go through some updates of the uh, firmware for my PCBs. Uh, let me grab the files. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, so I'm just gonna grab one board. Let's move this one, plug in the type B. So the new update uh, doesn't really add that much uh, functionality wise, but it fixes a little bit of a problem that the previous versions had which was that when you change the actuation points in every mode it will take a couple of seconds to actually finish to apply the changes and that was because I was writing to memory each time the value was updated and that was very bad so Right now, there's a new firmware and JSON that you can download. I'll leave the, uh, the link for that in chat. And I'll switch over to this one. So let's say that you have a board, uh, in this case type B, and you have the previous firmware on this board. So what you will do is, depending on which PCB you have, uh, you go to the usual side load folder, uh, and you basically go into the folder of the PCB that you have. So in this case, it's type B. So I go into type B, and there are going to be a binary file, so .bin, and a JSON file. You're going to need to download both on your machine. So, uh, is it JSON? No. 
we download. Okay, the JSON is done and we download also the binary. Now, what you're gonna do is go into VIA, so it will open like this, go into the design tab, and if you don't have this enabled, you only go to the settings and you enable show design tab. It will pop up this new tab. You click on load and you'll go and navigate and select the JSON file. A preview of the board will pop up and now we can open uh, QNK toolbox and we're gonna be reflashing the keyboard itself. So we go here, we select type B. Then we enter the DFU mode using the key combination that is programmed into the board. We hit flash and we wait for the flashing procedure. Uh, if you have the board on vial, this is a completely different uh, firmware. Uh, I think you're configuring via and vial, though. Okay. Now we go and click authorize. Yeah, you, you, you'd need to reflash. Uh, to be honest, it's only if you have uh, problems with the board. Uh, anyway, so we have flashed the new board, uh, the new firmware on the board. It works, it gets detected. So now I'm just gonna change a couple of keys. After that, if your board supports multi-layout, you'll need to go into the layout tab and select all the key layouts that you currently have. So let's say you have a split backspace, ISO, wing keyless, whatever, you select those uh, options. Then you're gonna, know, uh, you're gonna need to go into the EC tools tab, calibration, you enable bottoming calibration, and again, as the previous versions, you go through all the keys, make sure that you press them until you bottom out. You don't have to force the bottom out, you can use a normal pressure. After you've pressed all the keys, you unclick this, and now we have the calibration saved on board. Uh, there is now a new button in the actuation tab uh, and it is available in both APC mode and rapid trigger. Uh, basically, previously, each time you moved the slider, the values would be applied immediately. But that means that even if the value changes by one, there would be an entire rewrite of the entire board. Uh, on memory and that is why it would take a couple of seconds if you dragged the slider around to actually finish processing that so now if you move the sliders so like this and you don't click apply and save changes those values are not stored on the board so now I've changed the default ones if I unplug the board and I plug it back in there we go. And I plug it back in, I re-enter via. The actuations are not changed. The only way to actually apply the changes is by making your changes, whatever those are. Then click apply. There's no dialogue uh, that actually tells you that it's done. It's now instantaneous. So now I've changed the values. If I unplug, and I plug the board back in, this time we will see the values are stored in memory, as we expect. Another thing that was addressed was a kind of a 
bug uh, slash how the board works. So the way I mitigate bass noise and um, values of the bottom out not being equal uh, are through a calibration at boot process and the bottoming calibration that we do manually by pressing each key. So what happens when you plug in the board is as soon as you give power to the keyboard, it basically scans the state of each and every key for X amount of numbers and then creates an average mapping of those. And that is the bass noise. So whatever baseline reading we have on the board. The issue is that if you are holding the keyboard like this and you're pressing keys while you're doing it, those values are gonna be wrongfully uh, interpreted as a higher noise than usual. So basically if the normal quote unquote bass noise is 100 uh, and I hold the board like this, all those keys are gonna read basically a thousand or whatever the maximum value is. And the issue is, uh, is that even if you do the bottoming calibration after that, those keys will not function properly because the unpressed state is wrong, uh, wrongfully um, asserted when you keep the keys being uh, pressed while you plug it in the board. So if you realize that you've plugged in the board while holding some keys, or you're having issues with some keys even after the calibration, what you will do is you go into the um, EC tools calibration, and what you're gonna do is you click on noise floor calibration and you must not keep any key pressed while clicking the button. So I'm not touching the board, I click this button. Now the actual bass noise is stored and then you can do the calibration again if the calibration is still messed up. So this mitigates the cases where the bass noise is cued because you're holding the keyboard while plugging it in. So those are the new stuff for the firmware. Uh, nothing critical, it's more of a like quality of life uh, stuff. Especially because usually when people use VIA to remap keys and etc, they change it and then close it right after. Uh, and the issue is that if the um, the update of the values wasn't completed uh, at the time you actually unplug the board or you close via, uh, that might create conflicts and mess up the board. But this time, since we only set the values and then we apply them only once, uh, so the persistent uh, state is written only once uh, when you click the button that helps with um, basically solving that issue and the base noise uh, button calibration is used again to um, remove any weird behavior that you might encounter if you were holding some keys down while plugging the board in It was possible uh, to run the recalibration of the noise floor on the fly, but I've decided to not do that, uh, simply because that would have impacted the scan rate quite a bit. And for now, I'm trying to determine the maximum scan rate for each average layout uh, for EC using the most basic MCU that we can use to First, reduce cost, and second, see how much I can optimize the code uh, to actually do what I want. Okay, so... I've already unboxed it and set it up. So, this is gonna be more of a walkthrough uh, of the HHKB Studio. So 
it came in this black box, a uh, very clean box, um, kind of like the same design language as the um, GX1, even though that's a gamer board as they try to market it, uh, the box is very business-like, so it's very, uh, very clean looking. Uh, there's basically nothing apart from the usual uh, CE and like recycle stuff made in China, etc. And then we have the information. Hello, there we go. Uh, US layout, so it's ANSI. There's only one color available as of now, and I think. If I'm not mistaken, the serial is like starts from 90000, so this should be the 17th uh, unit. So it's quite a bit lower than the uh, than the JIS that I had. So this is now my lowest uh, serial number board. So once you open it, uh, soft foam on the top case, uh, there was this letter uh, on top of the, uh, of the board, soft foam again on the bottom, in here we have the four AA batteries, non-rechargeable, uh, replacement uh, nipple tips, track point tips, and a braided USB-C to USB-C cable with an angled uh, receptor. So this is the content. Uh, in here, there's basically what we saw uh, last stream, because those are the documentation that were leaked. So here we have a list of LEDs indication and key combo because uh, on the hybrid um, series we only had a single LED with two colors and there was really no indication of which profile you were in, uh, which device you were connected to, so it was simply a on-off uh, LED. But here we have an LED bar, as they call it, uh, it's nothing more than four individual LEDs that are arranged with a piece of plastic on top of it. So calling it a light bar is a bit, mm, uh, a bit of a stretch. Uh, if they used single hole uh, for each LED, the result would have been basically the same. But we have some pretty good uh, and cool stuff um, with the new HHKB Studio. Uh, first of all, we have clear indication of which device we're connected to. So if we are connected to the first um, profile, the first LED, so the one to the left, will be lighted up. Uh, if it's the fourth, it's the one on the right, and so on. Uh, if we are connected to a USB port, so the data is transferred through the USB connection, all four LEDs will turn on to indicate that you're actually using the USB mode. Um, when you're switching between profiles, because now we have profiles that are common to all the shared devices, but there are four profiles that we can swap. Uh, and it's very handy if you have, for example, a key map that you want to run on Mac OS and Windows before you had to toggle the dip switches uh, and there was the legend for HHK, Win and Mac um, and you had to toggle them um, it wasn't really the greatest thing if you were using the board with two separate uh, OS's all the time uh, because you had to swap them the cool thing about the hybrid series was that even though if it, it was not advertised, each and every mode, so HHK, Windows and Mac, those were their own separate key maps. So if I 
um, remapped QWERTY to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 while on HHK mode. When I went, uh, when I go to uh, Windows mode, that was not stored in there. But if I go back to HHK mode, it was still there. So you effectively had three profiles, kinda, uh, that you can use. And also, the Windows and Mac was only a, really a thing if you leave the default key map, because you can, of course, put it in Windows mode and map the keys as if you're using uh, Mac OS and still use it uh, as if you were in Mac mode. So it was more of a easier way to explain it because they didn't have uh, a clear way to actually show it. Uh, <clears throat> so, another thing that the Lightwater is used for is to show the status of the levels of speed for the track point and the capacitive touch sliders. Uh, there's a combination of LEDs being off, on with a blue light, and on with a white light. Uh, so, there's a pretty good um, example here of the slowest mode is three LEDs off and then a white LED, and it basically flows over. Uh, it's kind of like a progress bar uh, of some sort. And then there are the default uh, key combinations. Um, there are different than the HHKB ones. Uh, some of them are kind of shared, uh, some of them are not. Uh, for example, to start the pairing process, you still press Fn plus Q. Um, but this time, you can't really do the trick where you press Fn, Q, and then right after you select the profile and etc. Uh, so it's Fn plus Q, you enter the Bluetooth select mode, kinda. Uh, and then you press FN control and then one, two, three, four for your profile uh, of device. To switch between profiles, so key maps um, or application mapping, uh, however you want to call it, you press FN plus C and then you press one, two, three, four. Uh, so it's not a key combo as if you were choosing the device that you're connecting to, but it's FN plus C, you enter a profile select mode and then you can start to type on it. Uh, if you wanna check the status um, of the board, you press FN plus V and that will basically light up again the LEDs and based on where it's lighting up, you'll know on which device you're actually connected to. Then there are the default uh, mouse keys, um, speed, uh, acceleration profiles. Uh, there are four presets, and then you can increase those presets with um, by four, I think it is. Yeah, uh, by four uh, increments if you use uh, the other um, key combinations. As we will see later, as of now, the customization of those um, key combinations are not the greatest, but I hope that they will actually add something like a finer adjustment or user profiles that you can select. Here we have the brochure with basically instructions. We don't really care about it. And here we have the board. Uh, the red nipple, I've used an IBM, um, an IBM track point uh, nib. Uh, so this is not the stock one, uh, to be completely here.
yeah. Uh, if you see someone with a different color, uh, most likely they are swapping them in. Um, the nipple that you can use are the square type. Uh, so basically anything that is IBM compatible with normal height keyboards, uh, those will work just fine. So, little walkthrough of the board. The case is significantly bigger, in my opinion, than the hybrid series. Even without uh, considering the bump, you'll see that the footprint is bigger. It's not a insane amount, uh, but it's quite substantial. It's basically a full 1.8-ish millimeter. Uh, for you Imperial folks, that is almost half an inch. So it's noticeable. Uh, it has a weird impact at first use, but for some reasons that is actually a nicer thing, especially if you are using the board on a laptop. Uh, same goes for the depth. Even with the uh, battery bump, the board is slightly longer, as you can see. There we go. Slightly longer, just a little bit. Uh, so, at least it's flush. Uh, so, for those of you that hated the bump, uh, this is not an issue anymore. The top case is not um, shiny, it's texturized. Okay. It has a texture and the texture is the same on whole sides, even the capacitive um, touch regions. Same goes for the buttons for the mouse. They follow the same uh, pattern of textures. Uh, hi, Bacho. The keycaps are normal keycaps. Uh, nothing to say. Um, the cuts that they implemented to enable the track point use are, in my opinion, very nice because they are not super overdone and uh, especially on the B it's kind of hard to see but the nipple head doesn't protrude too much over the keycap uh, opening so there's no worry to press down the key and then catch like this it doesn't happen, at least to me but I'm pretty used to um, having the track point on the keyboard. Uh, a very, very sus thing that I have no idea why they went for it uh, is the spacebar. The spacebar is a 6U wide um, spacebar. So it's the same as normal HHKB. This is a true HHKB layout. But the issue is that we now enter the contradictory section of this board, among other things. Uh, this time, they decided to go with MX switches uh, in an effort to evolve as a company, as uh, the, um, the reps told uh, at the HHKB event in Japan. Uh, and also, as they said yesterday in the PFU America uh, stream. So, we can talk 
day and night uh, about the choice of not using Topre. But I'll try to review the board as a new device that has some uh, connection, historical, uh, I would say, um, with the idea of a device that serves the purposes of being an input device for the user and not as a piece that needs to inherit features from the lineup. Um, and that is pretty clear, especially when the CEO of PFU America, uh, Kutsuwada-san, said that the professional lineup will remain the lineup for the typists and the coders and etc. And it will continue to use the topper switches. But this will not receive an EC version. Was pretty clear about it. So I'm pretty confident in saying that the idea for this board was to create something different, something that they wanted to um, to explore and experiment with. The choice of keeping the HHKB layout at this point um, is not really, again, for continuity, but it's more because they're known for that. Uh, the fact that they are using MX switches and not Topper uh, is a bit confusing because after the Professional 2 lineup, basically everyone that was talking about HHKB, they were referring to the Pro 2 and upwards lineup, where the layout and the topper switches were basically merged together in the design and production language. And in this case, it's not. Uh, and it's very clear. They tried, I suspect, to have a similar sound profile by using a very customized uh, version of a MX switch. They didn't went to Cherry, uh, they went to Kale, and they basically recolored and used a different string of the Deep Sea, I think they're called, switches, which are double dampened or silenced, however you want to call it, switches. So they are dampened both on the downstroke and the upstroke, and we will see um, how they do it. Um, so, until now, everything good. It's when the NA branch stepped in that we are having issues now. First of all, uh, the way they tried to market it as a justification for the MX um, choice was customization. First point. If you have holes in three of your keycaps, customization is not a real option. Uh, yes, people can Dremel their keycaps, but that is not a thing that everyone will do. I also know that not everyone that have custom MX key sets will actually buy an HHKB. So they get a net zero point for that. Then there's the spacebar thing. Uh, you might say, hey, 6U, oh damn boy, 6U spacebar are not in base kits, like ever. Uh, and you're right, there are spacebar kits still. Admittedly, 6U was pretty much disappearing uh, from spacebar kits too. But in, lately, we've seen a, a couple of key sets that actually brought it, brought it back. Uh, I suspect mainly because of the uh, diffusion of custom EC kits and true HHKB again. So they basically had to recreate the market. But there's an issue with this base bar. The stabilizers are 6.25 which literally is not the standard for 6U spacebars. Like, if you had a net zero points 
for the customization of keycaps. Now your negative infinity. The idea, it seems that they are going to release the spacebar. Spacebar for sure. Uh, I don't know about the rest of the keycaps, but spacebar for sure. The CAD models, so you can make your own. But that's not really a solution because no one in their right mind are gonna actually run key sets with a specific key only for HHKV Studio users. It, it, it's not gonna happen, you know? Like, if I go to NoStyle and I tell, tell him, hey, uh, that minion set that you're gonna run, what if you added a 6U spacebar? And he would reply, yes, but with 6.25 steps, he would basically scream at me and block me. Rightfully so. So the choice of going 6.25 makes absolutely no fucking sense. It, it, it makes no sense. Um, I don't know what the hell they were thinking, especially because they messed up mo in multiple points of the design. First of all, the molds. They had to pay for molds for this. So that's one. Second, they bought 6.25 stabilizers. So there's the second one. Second point where they might have thought that 6U and 6.25 are not the same. Third point of failure. Plate. The holes are for 6.25. So they were sure about the 6.25. And they were even more sure about it because those are not plate mounted stabs. Those are PCB mounted stabs. And they have holes specifically for this stabilizer size. So they went all in in this. I have no idea why. Uh, on the subject of stabilizers, uh, they are PCB mounted. Uh, from what I've seen, I think there's an insert, a rubber insert, um, or a silicone insert that basically dampens the bottom out on the PCB. And we will take a look at that um, in a bit. For those of you that asked in Lightning um, stream what the button uh, was used for in the spacebar, the button is used for reset and DFU. Uh, and this is my entry point for the conversion. About the switches, uh, the switches again are Kyle uh, recoloring of the deep sea, deep blue sea, whatever the name is, uh, switches. They have a similar um, curve for the actuation. It's hot swap. Uh, also, the mouse buttons are hot swap. Uh, for those of you that asked in other streams. The switch is very interesting. And again, it's a double dampened switch with a longer than usual spring. The bottom housing has lube and the tip of the uh, spring actually is lubed. It's a box design, and you can see on the bottom, this white section is the dampening um, material. Then we have a smoky uh, slider. And then on the top piece, on the rails, I don't know if you can see them, there are dampening inserts, those white thingy, that dampen the upstroke. So this is how they are achieving that kind of like topper sound without all the plasticky noise that they were referring to.
and the spring is very long i think it's a 20 millimeter uh we can actually measure it yeah it's a two centimeter long spring and the reason for using such a long spring is so that the spring is pre-compressed and you don't start from a zero or like near zero um, um, force, but you start a little bit higher. Uh, and that is to try to mimic the uh, initial topper feel. Uh, stock, very smooth, no complaint there. The mouse buttons are removable. They have a double-sided uh, foam pad insert so that it doesn't um, hit plastic on plastic. The switches are hot swap and those are Gatoron low profile browns. Not my favorite, they're fine. Uh, they have a very distinct um, ticking noise. Uh, especially when you are using it properly and you gently tap like this sometimes you can hear either the leaf or the uh the spring i'm not really sure which one is the root cause uh, but that's that's not really pleasing um the other great feature about this board is the left right side and the bottom left and bottom right side are capacitive touch surfaces uh, because the texture is the same across the top side of the board uh, there was no real way to um, give a beginning and an end to those surfaces without adding little plastic uh, tabs basically so the actual capacitive surface starts from here and it goes all the way to here so th that gives you a tactile feedback on where you are uh, on the travel they're pretty generous uh, I gotta say and the implementation is quite nice, I gotta say. On the back, we have USB-C. Uh, I'm not really a fan of how they actually implemented the opening. It, it's, it's not centered. Uh, like, there's a big ass opening, bigger than it should be. I don't really like it, especially when the HHKB Professional Classic was basically perfect. This time around, we are lacking a on-off button, but we have a on-off switch. Uh, first disappointment with the on-off switch is that there's no power on when the USB cable is plugged in. Example, on the HHKB Professional Hybrid, when you were in USB mode, okay, so now I'm in USB mode, okay, the board can be powered, I have the batteries, but can be powered through the USB cable. And I know that because if I remove it, the board automatically turns off even though I have the batteries in it. And if I plug it in, the board automatically powers up from the power of the USB. And now it turns off. On the studio, if you have the switch off and you plug the board in, regardless if the last mode was Bluetooth or USB, the board will not work. It will not power up nothing you must turn the board on by enabling uh, basically switching on the board it's not really ideal for me 
I'd rather have the on feature like this than have a switch. Like, if I want to use this only with USB, I shouldn't be forced to toggle on a button. I, I don't see the point in this. Like, I really, really do not see the point in this. Also, another thing, and I think this is a bug. So, if we take a look at how they say to us to switch between modes. Now I was in USB mode, okay? I'm in USB mode. The board is on, okay? And we can see that it works, okay? So, without swapping to a Bluetooth mode, okay? The way they say to switch between the various modes is, if you wanna go into Bluetooth mode, okay, you should press FN control and then whatever profile uh, device you have. So FN control one, two, three, four to switch between the Bluetooth devices, okay? If I do it now, it will enter Bluetooth mode, okay? But if I don't do that, I leave the board on, I unplug, the board is now unplugged, the board is still on though, okay? I have a Bluetooth receiver on the same PC and I have this board paired. If I press FN, control, and two, which is the binding, the board does nothing. It, it doesn't work, it's not registering, it's not even connected. So there's no indication that the board exited the USB mode, but it's still on, other than this. So the only way to make it operable again is either by connecting the USB cable, enter Bluetooth mode from this, or turn the board off, turn it on again, okay, and now it starts to search for the Bluetooth. See? And this is a fatal flaw. Why? Because they are using a switch and not a button. It's a fatal flaw. If I instead, I connect the board, I enter USB mode. USB mode is indicated by four LEDs turned on, okay? So now it's in USB mode. And again, I'll do the same. I unplug, I try to swap to Bluetooth. It doesn't work. It's stuck in this, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing state that forces you to turn off the board or to put it in Bluetooth mode before you unplug the board. So four LEDs, if I FN control two, it will start to search for the Bluetooth. It unplugs as a USB device. It still sends commands, but I'm not doing it through the USB, you see? So this is a weird behavior that at first is not very clear. Why? Because it doesn't automatically turn off nor it's try to enter Bluetooth mode. With the hybrid, it was pretty smart because you unplug it and you're done. You are sure that this is, this is off or that it's not entering Bluetooth mode. And if you accidentally had it paired with the same board, uh, sorry, with the same PC, and you chuck this in into your backpack, that this will actually send keystrokes. So the proper way to do this handle the unplugged of the USB would be to turn off the board completely. But because they have a switch, it's not possible. Okay. So 
But this is a one of the reasons why I don't like a toggle. And they could have done the button while having the light bar. Because the issue here for the classic and the professional uh, hybrid is not that we have a button, so a soft start, essentially. It's that we have only one LED. But if we had this single button on the studio, but still retained the four LEDs, this would have been miles better. So this is a usability thing that worries me. Because I'm, I'm not sure, unless I test the power consumption, that in this middle state, this middle earth state, the board is not in a power, normal power profile instead of a deep slit state, okay? So this is weird. It's weird and it's not written anywhere on the documentation. Another thing that is not written anywhere in the documentation that was very, very clearly stated in the classic, uh, sorry, in the hybrid series is how do I unpair every single device? On the classic, uh, sorry, on the hybrid, there was a key combination to wipe out all the bindings for the Bluetooth. I could not find anywhere on the software nor the manuals, both in Japanese and English, if there is a key combination to wipe out the memory. And I mean wipe out the binding of the Bluetooth. So another issue, I, I don't know. I bought this unit from someone in the EU that tried it when PFU sent it uh, to them. And I wasn't sure if all the profiles were already binded to another device. Because if that was the case, I had to follow another procedure, not the one where I simply press FNQ and then enter the first device and it will automatically start to enter pairing mode, but I would have to enter the first mode. It wouldn't, sur it wouldn't connect because it would search for that device of the other person. And then I would, uh, I'd have to enter or force the repairing for that profile. So that, that's the flaw. Uh, yes, the Nibble uh, is removable. The one that comes with the board is a black one. I replaced it with a IBM, uh, an IBM one. Okay, so this now gets more interesting. Gets more interesting on the back. So I turn off the board, okay. A very nice addition, I think, is big ass and long rubber fit, soft rubber fit. Uh, very nice because they're not as grippy as the Professional 2. Professional 2 are small as hell, but they are grippy as hell. Like, this thing is not moving, okay? This one, eh, it moves, okay? It's not crazy, okay? But the hybrid was like a tank, okay? It is nice for those of us that use this board on a laptop because the way they implemented the fit on the hybrid, it was very, very short in terms of how much the fit would actually came in contact with the case, especially on like MacBooks. Uh, on the 13 inch, no issues whatsoever. On the 14, 14 is, you can align it properly, otherwise the fit will actually jump on a key on the keyboard underneath and it will start to actuate. On this one, no issues. And it's also easier to align because being bigger, it will basically allow you to align it with the case and not the ridges of the speaker grills. 
So on the back, very simple branding, HHKB Studio, uh, nothing there. A thing that was sus was this big ass panel. Uh, I'm not really a fan of panels because they can warp, they can be damaged, and the bigger the panel, the bigger the stuff there is under it, and the more if you lose or break this, you're gonna have a bad time. So the hybrid one was iffy because of how the plastic bit here could break off quite easily, but was very very nicely done uh, and I actually prefer this for reasons that we will see now so once you open this you slide it up you take it out you're welcomed with a sticker that basically replicates the basic uh, connection shortcuts and this it's basically the same that we had on the uh, the HHKB hybrid. So this is the studio, this is the hybrid. So it's basically this section, okay? The section about the FCC stuff, uh, regulatory information and dip switch on the studio is on the main body sticker. Uh, interestingly though, where on the hybrid and classic we had the modes for HHKB Windows and Mac and then the rebind of the LED, uh, sorry, delete, backspace, uh, FN, etc. Here, the dip switches are used for something quite different. Um, the first one is used to um, enable or disable the mouse keys. Then the other four are used to um, enable the uh, gesture pads, the pointer stick. Um, if you want the scroll um, to be inverse, like natural or uh, reverse, as the Mac users say. Uh, if you want to have uh, delete on backspace or backspace on delete. Um, and then power saving. Power saving after 30 minutes, the board will enter deep sleep mode, and only if you press return, it will exit that mode. Uh, so I suspect that um, the fact that you need to press on enter is because enter in the matrix is also bind to some kind of system tick uh, interrupt pin on the MCU. So this time around, we are, we are using four AA batteries. Uh, reason being, I'm not really sure why. Uh, I'm not really sure because the MCU actually runs at 1.8 volts this time around instead of 3.3. Uh, the gesture pads work at 1.8 volts too. And for whatever reason, I've probed a 2.5 volt signal for the matrix strobe. I'm not sure if it's correct, um, but mm, uh, I gotta test that. Uh, the way you insert the batteries is pretty straightforward. There's an opening to the left that is bigger and you basically slide them in, kind of like a shotgun. Uh, very fun. The tension is quite high and that actually introduces one of the issues uh, that I have with this system. On the hybrid series we had a two battery solution and they were pretty tight in there and there was again a barrel system so like shotgun style reload okay but because the first battery was fully enclosed and on the door uh, we had foam to basically keep the batteries in place when you have the batteries installed okay between the tension that the compression of the spring 
uh, contact it gives and the foam once you fully close it. There was no rattle beyond keycap rattle, okay? On this board, because the system is open and you have way more batteries than before, you can't add foam anywhere to secure or reduce the space for the batteries. So even though here they seem pretty snug, they are actually moving, they can move. And it's especially noticeable when you are picking up the board and you move it around. If you have thicker batteries, uh, I found that the um, rechargeable one from IKEA, they are better than normal ones, quote unquote. Uh, if you try to use the uh, the ones that are provided with the board, you basically have an HHKB Studio Maracas Edition. Uh, and for that, I have a video that I can show you. Uh, let's see if I can share it. Okay. I will mute music for a second. I hope this comes through. So this is with the stock batteries. Especially on the last bit from here onwards. That sound wasn't the keycap. Those were the batteries moving up and down inside of this channel. I don't really like it. Uh, not ideal, in my opinion. Uh, the root cause is how they implemented the battery compartment. I appreciate that they are still using batteries, like off-the-shelf batteries. I'm a old guy, I don't want lithium ion in my devices unless it's a phone or a laptop. I want to be able to just enter whatever convenience store I have around and still be able to use my keyboard. I'm one of those guys, okay? I could have appreciated a single battery uh, system or a dual one. It was completely doable, a dual battery system, because they don't need the extra capacity. Why? Because the batteries are in series. So they are not adding the capacity, they're adding the voltage. The same goes for the uh, hybrid. The maximum capacity that you can have on that board is whatever the capacity of the battery was, a single one. Okay, so it is what it is, you know. And also, I'm not really understanding why they need more batteries if the MCU runs at an even lower voltage. I, I, I don't understand it. In fact, what I'm planning to do with the conversion is kind of like the battery mod that I did for the hybrid is to use, in order to reuse this case, use dummy AA converters, slide them in and have them shorted, and then a single uh, 14500 uh, lithium ion cell, and that is the last one that you plug in, so that it basically shorts everything. That way you will have battery uh, recharge. And a good thing is, since I'll hijack the USB port pins, the recharge will work even if the board is off. So we're gonna take a look at the board. Uh, I'm not gonna do a full disassembly, uh, simply because I don't think it's necessary at this point. So for the 
hybrid series we had three batteries uh, sorry three uh, screws one under the battery compartment and then two on the sides here we have uh, quite a bit more we have three in the battery compartment and then four on the outside so normal Philips head screw and a disappointing thing is that again they are not using uh, metal inserts for the screws this is pure uh, thread making screws so if you mess this up you're gonna end up with a case that is inoperable We have our first screw under the feet, right on the edge. There's one. There's two. Then one here. And now the screws are done. So the way I found it's easier to open this is credit card. Um, I fix it. Uh, thingy plastic ones we have tabs on this side this side and the bottom side doesn't have tabs but has like um, alignment um, tabs kind of like those ones so those don't actually snap in place they don't lock but they are designed in such a way that you basically have to angle up the board, uh, the bottom case like this. So the way to open this that I found is easier is you stick your finger here and then you chuck your prying tool in here. You go to the side and you start to raise it. Okay. Then you keep some tension so that it doesn't pop in again. You go on the other side, you do the same, and you start to unclip the first one, simply by tension of the entire case. Then you go to the side, and you start to go down until you reach the end. At this point, you swap, and you go on the other side, you go like this. Now there's the tricky part you basically have to move this piece and slightly force it outwards so that the battery uh, receptor can actually go over it. So to do that, you either use a prying tool and you kind of like do this or you simply go gently and slowly and you try to get it over now you have a board like this and you simply lift it using the bottom side as a pivot a pivot so now you have your bottom piece and now we have the internals here we have the battery contacts usb port power on power off dip switches and we have a multi-board construction, an interesting one actually. So right away, 
Here we have the wireless antenna. Under it, we have the wireless MCU. Here we have the main MCU. And as I was saying in the documentation, they have a sorta of an isolated ground plane for this, but it's coupled with zero ohm resistors. Uh, a thing that I noticed about the controller board, <coughs> sorry, is that it almost looks like it's auto routed. The reason I'm saying it is because of how the resistors are placed and also because all the connections are vertical and horizontal. Uh, we have also a ton of ribbon cable connectors. So the bigger one is for the matrix board and the mouse buttons. This one is of course for the uh, mouse, uh, nipple module. And as I was saying in the uh, documentation overlook, the way it's secured in place, there's a back piece, so this plate, those two screws go through the plate and they basically clamp everything together. Then we have four of these connectors that go to the touch um, capacitive uh, boards. And we can see those capacitive boards if we turn off the light a little bit and we can see them here. They are 3M stick uh, stick to, to the case. So if you remove them, first of all, beware that you might snap the PCB in half. So you need to be gentle with it. Uh, and we can also see kind of a interesting thing. If we take a look here, we see where the plate screws are. One, two, we have some more uh, around and the interesting thing about this construction is that this light gray part is actually a bezel that you can remove I'm not really sure how the procedure to removing that uh, is and it's not really even necessary uh, what I care about is this main board so for this board, I'm planning to do a Q and K port and an EC conversion. The Q and K port aims to bring this board to Q and K, hopefully by maintaining also the wireless capabilities. Uh, the MCU is supported. Uh, I'm working on, first of all, reading what's on this chip. Uh, I've managed to get it into the FU mode. Uh, it is really protected, but I'm pretty sure I can get around it. Either because they forgot to lock out the byte that allows you to remove the read protection if you are able to do so, uh, but also because everything is exposed. Uh, I know what protocol the chips on the touch capacitive pods are. Uh, this, if it's not PSU, I'm going to cry, but I think I can figure out something for the nipple. Uh, for the wireless, uh, we're a bit in the dark. Uh, I'm sure that they are using NRF as the IC. And I'm sure that they're using one of the default configurations. So the plan to maintain the wireless capabilities is to basically dump the firmware of this MCU because we have programming headers here. So if we can dump right away this code, I can recreate this board with the same circuit and not care what the firmware actually does. Because as long as my implementation of the code of this MCU talks in the same way to this MCU for the wireless part as they are doing right now, for all intent and purposes, the wireless MCU 
could think that it's actually talking to an official, official quote unquote, uh, MCU. Okay, so that's my plan to maintain the wireless functionality. I don't want to write a custom firmware for this. I'm gonna cry if I have to do it. Uh, there's no obvious programming port for this MCU, nor a flashing. All the pins are exposed, so if the USB DFU mode isn't really helpful, what I can do is chuck some wires in it, use a J-Link, and try to, first of all, remove the read protection uh, to dump the current firmware, even though the firmware is downloadable and it's a simple binary file this time around. Um, so I, I think I can dump this pretty easily. The one that I care about the most is the wireless one. Uh, I don't think that this firmware is upgradable with a firmware update, like a normal one, because when the board enters DFU mode, the DFU mode applies only to this one. So this USB port is directly connected to this MCU. There's no USB connection to this one. So this firmware is persistent and it's not changeable. Uh, a drawback of using the STM lineup is that unless you obfuscate quite a bit what you're doing, someone that actually works with STM chips knows what's going on. For example, I know for a fact that when the firmware update happens on the keyboard from the remapping tool, they send a special command to the MCU to stop all it's doing and enter the FU mode on the fly. And I know that because I can see a USB device popping up that matches a DFU mode. Also, I know for a fact that they are not using custom like dual bank flash and rewrite thing for the reflash of this MCU. Why? Because at some point in the flashing procedure, this MCU uh, stops being that DFU device and it enters like a middleman state where it's actually a keyboard already but the remap tool is still saying that it's updating the firmware at like 90 percent uh of the way in so what i think they're doing is they're adding more time that they determined was necessary to flash this mcu to make you think that they are actually writing directly on the memory banks. It's not happening. So the plan for the QNK port is looking pretty promising because uh, I don't have to modify the hardware. Uh, and to be honest, if I can even only have the matrix work at first, then I know that I'm doing the right thing. Uh, next in line, would be to implement the touchpads. And the touchpad is gonna be simple-ish, as in the protocol is documented, I know what chip they're using. Uh, so as long as I configure the ports correctly, I can see what the module is expecting. Uh, there are documentations about how to set up the speed detection and etc. So those are fine. Uh, for the nipple, if they're using a custom communication protocol, then I'm pretty screwed. Um, if it's simple PS2, I can use that pretty easily. Last but not least, the wireless. For the wireless, I have determined that there's only a two wire connection between the MCU and the wireless device. So one is gonna be for sure a clock uh, of some sort. And another one is a input output a bidirectional um, path, basically. So as long as I can correlate whatever key key code this one is sending or receiving from the matrix to then being processed and tell this MCU what to do, wireless pretty much a guarantee this time. Uh, it was kind of a guarantee also with the 
um, hybrid series, but I'm lazy. I don't want to do all the work for everyone. Uh, I'm pretty tired of doing the work for basically them getting China. Uh, so this is looking very, very promising from my Q&K point of view. Uh, the EC conversion is going to be based heavily on the Q&K port because basically everything apart from the matrix is going to be the same. Um, so what I will add is the hardware here to address multiplexers uh, and all of that so that I can use the same controller board and only change the matrix board basically. Uh, the actual mounting is going to be quite iffy, uh, mainly because it's very tightly integrated. Uh, for the nipple, I'm confident that I can elongate the, um, uh, the stud, as I said in the previous stream. Uh, for the USB port and the power um, switch, I can do kinda what I was talking about the other time. Um, so here I have a screw, here I don't have a screw, but I can figure something out. Uh, yes, new plate of course, but because this is top mounted with a plate, I can swap out the plate uh, with no issues. Uh, on the subject of stabilizers, there's plenty of space here to do what we need to do. Uh, and if we don't have space for OEM parts, I can use tab parts and use basically what we have right now. Uh, on the subject of stabs, I said before that they had some kind of silicone insert for the bottom down dampening. And I can tell that because this is the uh, one section of the stabilizer. Here we have the screw. And here in the middle, there's a squishy thing, and this is silicone. So this is telling me that under the slider, there's some kind of silicone bit that actually dampens the bottom out. Um, can you drill holes here to make it proper 6U compatible? Absolutely. Uh, from this side, there is no trace on the other side, there is no trace. So what you can do is enlarge the holes here so that you have proper 6U config on the plate. Since it's not plate mounted, you can enlarge the opening so that it will fit the moved, the, sh uh, the shifted um, uh, housing. And you basically have fixed all the issues with the spacebar. You'll use warranty, of course, uh, but it's doable. So, to remount, you insert the bottom edge at an angle, you press it, Okay, then you need to move out of the way that bit and you start to press down. Okay, then you can start to re-add the screws. Yes, uh, you basically go back to 6U stab centered, uh, as it should have been from the get go. Oh, and I forgot to mention, but it's pretty obvious. There are flip out fit uh, two positions and there is a uh, rubber uh, on both um, angles options.
The plate on this board is metal. I'm not sure which metal, but it's metal and it's painted. There we go. We can reinsert batteries. Close the cover and we are done. I'll be right back and we will take a look at the Remap 2 software. Okay, we are back. So we are gonna take a look now at the remap software. Uh, beware that there was a bug with the first release of the remap tool, um, specifically the um, version 1.0.0. And they have, as of today, released a, an update uh, so the most up-to-date version of the software is the version 1.0.1 .1 that fixes a bug where if you try to flash the board, it wouldn't actually flash the new firmware. It would say 
uh, firmware update completed, but in reality, it wouldn't actually update the firmware. Uh, the new firmware fixes bugs, you know, the usual stuff. So they have a separate remap tool compared to the um, hybrid and classic series one. Uh, the style is basically the same, as in that you can see your profile here and the various uh, layers for that profile, but you can't modify them right away. Uh, the way you do it is by enter the edit key map. So here you have four profiles to choose from. The way you choose which profile is active on the board is by pressing FN then C. Uh, the light will blink white on the current profile. So now I'm in profile one because it is on the left. If I press two, it goes in the next one. If I do con, uh, FNC and then four, it now blinks on this side. So this selection is basically selecting the profile, which is different from selecting the device you're connecting to, okay? Uh, once you power down the board or you change modes, the last active profile will be the one that is uh, presented once you power on the board again. Uh, you have again the preview of the diff switches with uh, what is actually enabled and disabled. Uh, you can enable uh, the pointing stick and assign basically all the keys that you want at every single uh, FM layer. Here, you can enable or disable the gesture paths. And the way you select and change stuff is basically the same as the normal key matrix. So you press and you select a key. Uh, you can't change both for the nipple and the uh, capacitive pad the speed of detection on the software. You need to do it through keybind. Uh, if you take a look at the first profile, on FN2, we have some custom codes, uh, SPD 1, 2, 3, and 4, and then GSPD, low, mid, high, and max. Also, we have SPD plus and SPD minus. So SPD refers to the speed of the pointer, while GSPD is gesture speed. For the um, gesture detection, there's only four layers of um, sensitivity that you can select. And I suspect that is because the handling of the detection speed is done by the IC of the single uh, gesture pad. While instead for the nipple, if it's normal PS2 or like some other sort of protocol easily implementable, um, they can talk uh, the main MCU and nipple, um, and usually they have some values, preset values that you can select from. Um, a thing that I wish they added and that the Japanese community actually asked right away is, since you already have four preset values that are fixed, but are not the only available ones, because if I select the speed number two, for example, for me, it's too fast. It goes too fast. Uh, but speed number one is too slow. So what I do is I enable speed number two, and then through the key combination, I reduce by two the speed in a defined adjustment. So what the uh, users are asking is to have a menu here where you can select a kind of like on a mouse, uh, you can still have the four presets or like have a key code that points to a preset that it's either a default one or one that you specify. So 
in the same way you can in Logitech G Hub uh, have X amount of preset values for the sensitivity like this, they basically want to have the option to manually input a value or like select the three slider, which absolutely makes sense. Uh, it's not really that big of an implementation to make. Uh, I'm sure that whatever speed values this is pointing to, it's a fixed value or it's pointing to a define uh, in the uh, firmware. There's no issue, in my opinion, in defining four extra ones uh, that are stored in EEPROM. There's plenty of space, in my opinion. So this is, I'd say, one of the key features that they need to add. Another feature um, that is interesting is how they implemented the gesture pads control. So if we go um, and take a look at how the keystrokes are actually called, they are called as normal key codes. And we can say that because for example, on this gesture pad, uh, in the um, in the bottom, I have left and right arrows. If I go in a key tester and I move. You see that the key gets actuated as if I was pressing one. So they're not doing some custom endpoint stuff. Uh, same for the scroll wheel. They're not doing anything fancy here. Uh, they are emulating scroll wheel. But it's good. Uh, it's good in a way that it's a cool feature. It's usable. Uh, for what I'm doing right now for the testing, um, I have um, on the standard layer, I have um, mouse wheel up and down on the right side. Then on Windows, it doesn't work as expected. Uh, I wanted to have Alt and Tab to cycle through the tabs like this. Uh, but on Windows, it doesn't work really that way. Like it only jumps between one and the other. Um, the other tab, basically. Uh, on macOS, it's way better because it, it actually proposes you this view. Uh, so on macOS, works better, in my opinion. Um, then I have volume up and volume down. You'll see here the volume. Um, and then on the left side, I have left and right arrows for when I'm navigating uh, the code. A good thing is that the gestures are customizable for each and every layer. Uh, the gesture paths are enabled or disabled along all the profiles uh, on all the layers, but the key codes that you assign are layer specific. So for example, now I have volume up and volume down here. Um, or left and right. You'll see them left and right uh, are actuating. Okay. If I go on the first layer, then it's up and down arrows. So if I press FN, you'll see that the arrows are now up and down. So that is a nice feature, uh, I gotta say. Uh, a thing that I found pretty iffy is even on the lowest sensitivity, fine adjustment can be tricky. As in, at times, as long as you basically just rest your finger and do even like this, it actuates, you'll see that simply by doing this, rocking my finger while keeping the same pivot point, I have a change in the volume. So at times you have a super high sensitivity locally, but you don't have 
granularity, <clears throat> sorry, granularity of control of how that happens. Because at times you want to do it big like this and it works pretty well. But if I stop and I start to do this, like it's, it's weird. Uh, they need to implement something to fix that. Uh, I'm not sure it's actually fixable. And also my my lift off it needs to be precise. Otherwise it might like do this and I change the value again. Uh, but I think that is a thing of the IC on the touchpad. Uh, so I'm not really sure that it is a thing that they can address. Regarding the typing experience, uh, I'm not the biggest fan of linears, but I gotta say that these linears are quite smooth, tight, as in there's not really that much of a wobble uh, during the travel. The, um, the stabilized keys are good too. The mouse buttons are kind of iffy, uh, not really a fan of them. If you come from Topper, you'll find the experience tight and the travel, it feels very different, as in very short. Uh, the fact that it's dampened both on the upstroke and the downstroke makes for a weird sensation when typing, especially on the bottom out, because on Topper we have the famous soft bottom out. Uh, if you are one that bottom out, the bottom us out. So when you go from the HHKB to this, it feels very tight, very um, very sealed uh, in a way. Uh, the sound is nice. Uh, there's not really any weird noise coming from the switches. That is also given by the fact that you are using a box design. And also the fact that the spring is way longer than usual. So it's a two centimeter uh, spring and the initial weight of the spring is higher to simulate the higher uh, load that Topher has. Um, it basically mitigates a lot of um, weird behaviors that you have. So there's actually a way to exit that USB mode, but it's iffy, um, as in a way to re-enter the Bluetooth mode. But again, it's not written anywhere, is if you are in USB mode, as I am right now, okay, now I'm in USB mode, if I unplug, the board disconnects. The board is not connected. The way you can exit from this weird state is by pressing enter and it enters Bluetooth mode. But again, because you are not using software to turn off the entire system, it creates a weird situation. It's kind of like the dubious situation where on the hybrid you were like, hmm, is the board still on or is it off? Which again, you only need, if it's in deep slate, you only need to press the button once and it will actually light up and tell you the state. So it's not really a big deal. So right now it's on, okay? And if you press the button, it lights up by telling you that it's actually on. So they still have the same kind of behavior. Uh, the good thing about this one was that it will turn off instead of going into a weird deep slate, uh, deep state uh, mode. Uh, on this one, it automatically enters that weird mode 
and you're basically counting on your memory and recollection to actually turn the board off properly. Apart from that, uh, the experience with the nipple, which is basically the, the key selling point, uh, is is nice. The nipple is uh, reactive, it's smooth, uh, there's quite a fine um, sensitivity and you can see that when I try to basically go as little as possible, I'm barely touching it. And the mouse is still moving, not in a jitterish um, uh, way. The buttons are angled as the board itself. Again, I'm not really a big fan of the switches nor the keycaps, to be honest. So I would probably add like grip tape or something because they are textured, but not enough for my liking. So I would for sure uh, change something about it. So this is pretty much it for the HHKP Studio. Uh, I'll do my best to actually do the conversion for QNK. Uh, mainly to add customization and I guess that's that's pretty much it uh, for the board itself again I'm not gonna dive again into the oh why is it not topper and etc like we've determined that this is a separate thing uh, a new market that they wanted to um, explore they have all the rights to do it. And I think overall, it's not a bad board. It's not for everyone. Uh, if you are not one that actually is a uh, track point enjoyer, don't buy it. Uh, there's no attraction uh, to this. If you want a wireless board, buy an HHKB. If you want MX with HHKB layout, buy literally every single custom that is around. Uh, you're gonna pay the same in MSRP and you'll have a better board. So, if there's nothing that you guys wanna know about the board, or about something else, I think we can start to find someone to raid. I guess the no message in chat means that we can start to search someone to raid. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, Twitch.tv and let's see. Someone that is doing keyboards Slide, probably. Keyboards. Keyboard. Mm, okay, so there's literally no one doing keyboards right now. What is going on? Uh, if you guys have someone that you want to raid, let me know. Otherwise, I think I'll just end the stream here and not raid anyone. 
Because there's literally no one by. Seems like no one is online today, so I guess I'll end the stream here. So next streams, um, I wrote on the server that on Monday I would have received the HG replacement. I'm not sure that is happening because the tracking for the UPS package at first uh, said delivery on Monday, but now is in like rescheduling or whatever the hell uh, they are doing. So let me check real quick. Yeah, so we have two boards. One is the Alveos, uh, the unit that we already uh, reviewed, that is coming back. We are going to be swapping the PCB for the uh, Group Y unit one. Uh, and then down the line, we're going to also have a stainless steel plate once the Group Y for that is closed. The Alveos is in customs. Uh, it should be here on Tuesday, even though it's in Milan already, so I see no point in waiting one more day other than uh, delivering on Monday. But the UPS for the HG replacement, it's saying that... Delivery date will be provided as soon as possible. And it's super weird because it was scanned in Hong Kong uh, on the 11th. Uh, sorry, on the 4th. Then it said export scan. Your package is in transit. We are updating plans to schedule your delivery. And then it said again, your package is on the way. Check back later for delivery updates. So I have no idea what the fuck they're doing. Probably lack in uh, flights, I guess. Or like scheduling of the flights, I suppose. Because I know DHL had some scheduling stuff going on like they need a week or something uh, to actually schedule the uh a plane uh trip for this so i don't know what's going on mm, let's see maybe someone popped up uh on stream for keyboards if not we're gonna end for real this time Okay, no one is streaming. Uh, thank you everyone who joined. Uh, the VOD will be up as soon as Twitch will actually allow me to export it. Um, yeah, uh, expect updates on the uh, Q&K port. On the subject of porting, uh, the EC980C uh, is in the works. I have basically the board almost ready uh, i have to check the positioning of two screw positions and thanks to dave we have the funds to actually get a unit uh, though because of how the funds are handled um, i will be able to check those out later this month uh, around the 22nd so as soon as i have the funds unlocked for that i'll have a contact in korea get the board from leopold directly and i have it proxied to me so that i can properly validate so yeah 
that was the latest update. Uh, again, thank you everyone who joined and have a good day. Bye bye.